Hello. In this video, we're going to bring together the ideas we have learned about Markov chains together with some ideas on calculus. By doing so, we will arrive at something rather wonderful and powerful. The learning outcomes are fourfold. By the end of this video, I want you to be able to explain why the chapman kolmogorov relation is particularly useful in the context of continuous time Markov chains. I want you to be able to explain what is meant by the jump rate matrix for a continuous time Markov chain. I want you to be able to derive the Kolmogorov relationship for continuous time Markov chains. And I want you to show that the exponential of the jump rate matrix multiplied by time is the solution of the Kolmogorov relation. Before we get on to that, though, let's just briefly review some of the ideas that we have on Markov chains. Consider this blue square. I'm going to tell you that there are two states that it can be in. It can be in this blue state, or it can switch to this green state. As you can see from this movie, it does so at random times. That is to say, the times between each switch from the blue state to the green state, and vice versa, are not always the same. Sometimes the switches are more frequency, frequent, and sometimes they are less frequent. This is thus not a nice periodic oscillation, like a sine wave. We have learned in previous videos that we might describe this using a Markov chain with a transition graph like that shown here. The two states here represent the blue and green states, and the transition probabilities that are into our one-step transition probability matrix would then represent the probability of, it, of transition between the blue and green states in a time window of length delta t. In other words, we could divide our time axis into discrete lengths, chunks of length delta t, and the transition probability matrix would tell us about the probability of transition given that we wait for this particular length of time. Now the problem with this is, is, that, is that it is somewhat arbitrary. How should we go about selecting an appropriate amount of time to wait? In other words, why did we choose to divide up our time axis using the black line shown here? Why not divide each of these time windows into two using the red line shown here and measure the probability of transition in one of these shorter time windows? The solution to this, which allows us to avoid setting a time window completely, is to use calculus. Borrowing ideas that were covered in my video on the exponential function, Incidentally, if you haven't watched that one, it's probably a good idea to watch it first before watching the rest of this video. We write the transition probability matrix as a function of time. Hence, at the outset, when no time is elapsed, the transition probability matrix is equal to P of 0. At a time delta t later, it is given the symbol P of delta t. One further delta t seconds. After a further de delta t seconds have elapsed, it becomes p of 2 delta t, and so on. Now at this stage, I should make clear that this p of t function gives us a matrix and not simply a number, as was the case for the functions that I was looking at in my videos on the exponential. Despite this, however, we can use many of the same symbols we use when talking about functions that return scalars to talk about functions that return matrices. For example, we could define the first derivative of our function, p of t, the derivative would be dp of t by dt, in the same way that we define the derivative, of the, the derivative as the limit of a scalar-valued function. This gives us the equation here. dp of t by dt is equal to the limit, as delta t tends to zero, of p of t plus delta t minus p of t, over delta t. Critically though, the derivative on the right hand side is a matrix of derivatives, and the, li the limit, sorry, the derivative on the left hand side is a matrix of derivatives, and the limit on the right is a matrix of limits. In other words, in this expression, only delta t is a scalar. Every other symbol represents a matrix. We take the derivative of a matrix by differentiating each of its elements individually. And we take the limit of a matrix by calculating the limit of each of the elements in our matrix separately. 
Now, what is the point of all this? Well, what we are going to show in the remainder of this video is that solving the limit on the right-hand side of the equation gives us a differential equation which we can then solve. This will give us our function that returns the matrix of transition probabilities at time t when we solve the differential equation. The first step in doing this involves recalling a result that we learnt about when we were studying discrete time Markov chains. The result in question is the chapman kolmogorov relation, which I made a video about, so if you've forgotten about how that was derived or what this result was, watch this video again now. Now, as you no doubt remember, the chapman kolmogorov relationship told us that we can get the n plus m step transition probability of a discrete Markov chain by multiplying together the n-step transition probability matrix and the m-step transition probability matrix as shown here. A continuous analogue of this would therefore suggest that if we want probabilities of transitions taken over a total time of t plus h seconds, we can calculate this by multiplying together the matrix of transition probabilities we get from waiting t seconds and the transition probabilities that we get when we wait h seconds, as shown here. This result is useful in the context of solving the limit on the right-hand side of our putative differential equation, as it allows us to rewrite the factor of p of, p of t plus delta t as p of t multiplied by p of delta t, as shown here. We can then take a factor of p of t outside the bracket, giving us the following. Now if you look to the right of the limit sign, we have the factor of p of t. This obviously does not depend on delta t, and as such we can take it outside the limit. We thus arrive at an expression in which p of t is multiplied by a matrix of limits. Our final step is to call this matrix of limits q. We can set the elements of this matrix Q equal to anything. The only stipulation is that each of the sum, each of the rows must sum to zero. As we must, as we have a transition probability matrix, P of delta T, whose rows must sum to one, and we have substituted the identity, subtracted the identity from this, which will take one from each row. You will have a project and through this you will learn how to play about with these transition matrices and how, how we can model different things by setting the values, the elements of Q differently. For the time being though, let's summarise our results and make a few observations. As promised, I have arrived at a differential equation. It is called the Kolmogorov forward relation, a relationship and it relates um, the transition probabilities that depend on how long we wait, p of t, with the derivatives of this self-same matrix, dp of t by dt. The matrix Q, meanwhile, is a matrix of limits that we call the jump rate matrix. Now imagine that this differential equation did not involve matrices, that instead p of t was some scalar-valued function and q was just some scalar constant. You hopefully all would know that the solution of this differential equation was the exponential of the constant q multiplied by t. Now here is something to blow your minds. The solution of this differential equation involving matrices is the same. It is p of t equals the exponential of q multiplied by t. However, we need to carefully define what it means, what we mean by the exponential of a matrix. We do not mean take the exponential of each of the elements. We find the exponential of a matrix in the same way as we found the exponential of a scalar x. If you remember from my video on the, exp on the exponential, the exponential of a scalar is equal to 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial and so on. It is an infinite series. The exponential of q of t is just the same as shown here except that now when we write q squared 
we are implying that you must do a matrix multiplication, i.e. Q multiplied by Q. Now, as you can hopefully imagine, computing the exponential of a matrix and doing all these matrix multiplications is not feasible. So we generally have to adopt a different strategy to the, using this direct solution. You will learn about these strategies through the exercises. For now, though, I want to finish with one final observation. We have arrived at the differential equation shown here. dp of t by dt is equal to p of t multiplied by q. Now suppose that there existed some non-zero vector pi that when multiplied by q gave zero. What would this imply? Pi would be the stationary distribution of the Markov chain. Because p of t multiplied by q is equal to the rate of change of p of t. If this is equal to zero, then it stands to reason that the rate of change of the rate of change is equal to zero. The left hand side of the Kolmogorov relationship would be zero. We can thus find the stationary distribution of a continuous time Markov chain by finding some non-zero vector pi that satisfies pi multiplied by q is equal to zero. Again, this is something that you will learn about through the exercises. So to conclude then, I hope that you have now grasped the following ideas from this video. If you have, try some of the exercises. You will hopefully find that dealing with these continuous time Markov chains is simply a matter of solving relatively straightforward linear algebra and differential equation problems. Thank you.